Hi, I'm Larry Puckett, the DCC Guy. Well, since I came back from England, I've been working on a project here on the Piedmont Southern, and that is developing a pulp yard at Charlottesville. So we're going to take a look at how I went about doing that. But first, we've got a little bit of administrative work to take care of, and that is announcing the winner of the DCC Concepts Decoder and Stay Alive. And, drum roll, the individual that won that was Stuart. Stuart is located in the UK, and he goes by the name of Matrix UK. And I've pinned his winning comment uh, to the top of the list of comments for the video last week. And as soon as Stuart gets in contact with me, we'll make arrangements to ship that decoder to him back in the UK. Now, for this coming week, I've got a new catchphrase for you. So that catchphrase for this week is going to be my dog Buddy, because I have two dogs and Buddy didn't like the fact that uh, Chewy got first billing on the video last week. And as a result, Buddy wants his turn at being the star of the show. So again, the catchphrase will be my dog Buddy, and that will appear later in the video. And all you have to do is write down the on-screen time that I make that statement about my dog Buddy and enter that in the comments. Create your own unique comment. And then enter that phrase and the time at which I uttered it in the video and that'll be it. And then after three days, we're going to cut it back to three days because Four days, it didn't take that long. Most of the, 99% of you guys had already entered uh, within the first three days. So I'm going to cut it off after three days. The other thing that I wanted to mention is this time around, I'm going to hold all of the comments until after I have selected the winner. So that way people will not be able to read other people's comments and get the timestamp from those. Unfortunately, I didn't catch that right off. And I don't know if anybody did that. Hopefully they didn't. But what, uh, what we'll be doing this time is I will hold all of the comments for review. So you won't see them until the middle of next week. So that's all uh, for the administrative trivia. Let's go ahead and take a look at how I went about modeling a pulp yard here in Charlottesville on the Piedmont Southern. <laughs> Okay, let's briefly talk about pulp yards before we get started with how I went about doing it. Now, pulp yards are something that were very common uh, throughout the United States, except for the desert southwest. Sorry, guys out there. But they were very common, and uh, particularly in the southeast, the northeast, the midwest, the northwest, anywhere that you had a lot of forest, you probably had a pulp wood operation going on. And basically, pulp wood was small diameter uh, trees, typically around six inches in diameter, and different companies had different definitions of what they would accept, apparently, as pulp wood. But at any rate, uh, farmers and loggers would cut these uh, trees, small trees, into lengths about, I think, five feet long, something on that order, and then load them onto a truck and haul them into a siding somewhere on the railroad where there would be anywhere from one to you know, a dozen, 20, however many pulp racks or whatever they were using to haul the logs would be made available. And the farmers or the loggers could pull up alongside of the car. The agent at the site would make some measurements and calculate how many cords of wood uh, were delivered. And then it was up to the farmers uh, to unload these by hand. And I'll show you some pictures here in a minute about how they went about doing that. And they typically used anything. They would use flat cars. They would use gondolas. They would use special built um, pulp racks that uh, they could load these on to. And then after that, they were shipped off to a, an industry that would use that pulp for making paper. It was also used for making uh, rayon. It was used for making things like cellulose acetate and even cellophane. So cellophane wrappers and cellophane tape are all made from cellulose derived from pulp. 
nowadays the operation has changed a lot. The logs are typically brought into one larger central location where they're debarked and turned into wood chips, loaded into wood chip hoppers, and those are then transported to the industries that uh, are, use them to make the pulp for uh, the paper and the rayon and the various other products that it's turned into. So it's a slightly different operation. I imagine that there are still places where you can uh, see individual truckloads being brought in and unloaded. So let's go ahead. What I want to do now is show you a few photographs. Unfortunately, I have a very large number of photographs of these operations, particularly on the Southern Railway, but most of them are copyright protected, so I can't show them to you. But if you do a search online for pulpwood loading, you'll find just tons of photographs available that show these things in different stages. However, I do have a few uh, photographs here to share with you that show some loading operations and I found these on a site that had copyright free photographs. So I was able to download. Uh, most of these came from the Forest Service and our upper Midwest. So let's go ahead and get started with a look at pulpwood yards. Okay, let's go ahead and, and take a look at the common way that farmers and loggers would come in and unload or transfer their load of logs from their trucks into the waiting rail cars. And in, in many railroads, they use gondolas for this, and they could really pile it up high on those. In the southeast, it was much more common to see special built pulp racks available uh, for this purpose. So what we have here then is a shot showing some workers unloading a, a load of logs directly into a gondola. And in this photograph here, as you can see, we have a very similar scene with logs being unloaded directly into a gondola here. This particular railroad apparently built a platform next to the tracks that the trucks could be driven up onto so that it was much easier to transfer the logs directly from the trucks into the waiting rail cars. Again, they're using gondolas in this particular case. As time progressed and things became much larger scale, larger trucks and, and the like, they started using these small cranes that I'm not sure if these were attached directly to the trucks or if they were attached directly to the rail cars or if they were just kind of freestanding out there in the yard somewhere. But at any rate, they had these small cranes. Some of them had uh, claws on the, uh, on the end that they could grab large bundles of logs and transfer them directly into the rail car. Later on, as things got even larger scale, you can see here just very, very large piles of logs and they use these very large cranes. And I've seen these in use on the Southern Railway as well, and other railroads throughout the, uh, throughout the country eventually went to these large cranes for loading the logs directly into the cars. And you can see they could pile a lot of logs up on these flat cars that were being used in this particular case. Okay, so that's all of the photos I was able to come up with that were free, but as I said, just do a search on the internet for pulp yard or pulp loading and anything like that, and you will find just tons of photos that will become available for you to look at and get an idea of how you should go about uh, putting together your own set of cars and the like for loading pulp wood in a pulp yard. But for right now, let's go ahead and take a look at how I went about doing it on the Piedmont Southern. Now I thought I'd begin by showing you the area here on the uh, Piedmont Southern in Charlottesville that I'm going to be using for the uh, pulp yard. So as you can see, it's just a long stretch of track that extends from the end of the yard uh, down, oh, probably three feet, I think it is, something on that order. And it's just a long, skinny dirt lot with one piece of track. At this point then, we have to start thinking, what do we need to add here? So the first thing we're going to want to add is a shack or a building where the, that can be used as the yard office. 
So let me add that. Every pulp yard needs a yard office. And in this case, it's big enough to where it's got its own office. Now, if, if the uh, yard was located next to a freight depot or a station, then everything would have been handled out of the depot itself or out of the station. But with a separate uh, facility like this, you need a yard office where the agent can, uh, can do his paperwork and stay in out of the sun and the wind and the rain and the cold and keep track of things as people bring in loads of logs. So that's what we've got this guy here. One thing that I do need uh, to add here that I don't have I need to get a, a dog of some kind to put down here on the front porch, just watching the scene uh, as the trucks come in and everybody else working here. And I know my dog Buddy would love to be uh, added to this. You know, he was kind of upset because uh, I used my other dog's name, Chewy, in the last video. Before we go on, I want to ask you to take a moment to subscribe to the channel. It's simple, easy, and free. All you have to do is hit that little red uh, subscribe button, and when the little bell comes up, click on it and click all. Okay, so next we're going to bring in a string of uh, empty pulp racks and spot them to be loaded. Okay, we'll pull back the loads. They're ready to go out. So what else do we need? Well, how about some logs ready to be loaded? Okay, so now you can see we've got a couple of stacks of logs that need to be loaded into the cars. But how do they get there? Let's take a look at the trucks that bring the logs into the pulp yards. Okay, so you can see one is coming to the yard. He's here on the right end, and he's loaded with a bunch of logs. Now this was a very common way that uh, it was done back in the 50s, 60s, even 40s and earlier, is that a farmer would load up his truck and would bring it in, and then they would unload directly into the cars, just as I showed you in the uh, lead-in uh, description up front. So, we've got a truckload coming in, and in this case, because it's a slightly larger yard, uh, they're not going to be unloading by hand. They're actually going to be using some mechanical equipment. So, let's take a look at that, bring that into the scene. So, magically, a forklift has appeared, and you can see he has a load of logs uh, that he has lifted up, and he's going to be positioning it on this uh, C&O pulp rack. Now, these guys were, you know, fairly common in use on these, uh, in these pulp yards, around the South at least. And I know that I've seen these particular, uh, similar ones to these, in use in photographs from the Southern Railway throughout the South. And I know in particular that uh, in Lynchburg, or at least uh, at Monroe Yard near Lynchburg, they use these. I have photographs that show them in them. Unfortunately, I can't show them to you because they're copyright protected. But they use these a lot throughout the 1950s. As the height of the Dagon cars got taller, one thing that they had to do was come up with a different way of loading logs into them because they extended the height of these quite a bit by adding extensions onto the tops of those bulkheads at each end of the car. So constantly what they did is they went to the cranes, like I showed you in the opening shots, and they were able to actually load those using either claws or clamshell type devices to pick up the logs, or also using cables, as they've done here. But through the 50s, it looks to me like, from the photographs, the Southern was using these, I believe they were called a, a heister, was the uh, brand that they used. There were other brands that were available. Taylor uh, also made these. So they would use these to pick up whole loads of logs 
and position them on the cars, they could unload directly from the trucks. So it made it a lot easier and faster to load a car than having it sitting around. But, you know, for a lot of the time, we're talking about one or two cars being placed on a siding next to a station somewhere and farmers coming in unloading a truck load of logs directly into one of these because they just did not have uh, the amount of business, the number of people coming in to unload to justify having a piece of equipment like these forklifts to unload these individual trucks. So you would have the farmer coming in with his truck load of pulp logs pulling up next to the pulp rack car and unloading directly onto it, as I showed you in some of those photographs at the beginning. Okay, so let's, let's go ahead and take a closer look then at how I modeled these, because this is something that you can't find off the shelf. Now this particular truck here began life as a classic metalworks truck. Uh, I think this particular one is 1940s, 50s era, and I basically just chopped the sides of the bed and the rear of the bed off, making it just wide enough for a load of logs and about the same length as the frame of, of the truck itself. And then it was a simple matter to uh, glue a set of logs onto the flatbed of the truck. So it's pretty simple, pretty straightforward, easy to do. And all you have to do is find a truck like this one here and chop it down, add your logs, and you're ready to go. And uh, this was a very, very common method that they would use, particularly a lot of the photographs that I've seen of these farmers bringing their truckloads in looked pretty much like this. Let's go ahead and pan left a bit and take a look at the yard office. Now this is a, a, a laser kit. It's a, I believe it was made by a company called GC Laser. It might still be available today, but just about all of the companies that make laser cut kits will produ uh, do produce a building similar to this one. So there's nothing particularly magical about this. I put this together and we've got the, the little figure here. That's one of the Model U figures from the UK. And he looks perfectly at home here in the US supervising the loading of the logs here in the yard. And these guys, you know, they would be around either in the building itself or if we're talking about a trek, uh, available next to a station depot, freight depot or a station, and then the agent there at the depot or at the, uh, or at the station would come out and he would typically measure the logs and figure out how many cords of wood were, were uh, delivered uh, by this farmer and make a record of it so that the farmer could get paid. Now let's go ahead and move a little bit further to the left and we'll take a look at the forklift that I used. Now this, uh, this particular forklift, you could use just about any forklift, but this one seems to be pretty good sized and very close to the ones that the Southern Railway used. And in this case, this was a pewter casting. It's made by a company called GHQ. And you can go to their website, ghqmodels.com, and they still have these available on there. I don't remember what the price is, and because it comes as a kit, it makes it easy to modify it. So I placed it here with the forklift as high as I possibly could get it. And then I took the arms and reversed them and put them at the top so that they extended it up even further. And this is pretty much what it looks like in the photographs that I have seen online of these particular forklifts. And then they just, uh, then you can just string some cables from those extended arms. And those are just some wires that I pulled out of some stranded wire uh, that I have here on the model railroad. So it was fairly straightforward. Drilled a couple of holes in each one of those uh, forklift arms and ran the wires through, soldered them together so that they wouldn't unravel and installed my logs in those. So this is a great way that you can customize your forklifts, uh, your kits, whatever you're going to be using for this particular use on the model railroad because I haven't seen any of these available. You're also probably going to want to add a few details like some barrels and trash cans, that kind of thing sitting around. A bright red oil drum like this is going to draw the, uh, the viewer's eye 
and keep them looking at the scene longer. And you want to position things like that around the scene itself because it's going to make the scene a lot larger in their minds because if they have to keep looking from one area to the next to see one detail after the other, it's going to keep them interested and keep them uh, looking at the scene a lot longer. Okay, I've zoomed out to try to give you a view of the completed scene and we'll take a, uh, we'll take a, a pan of the area as well in just a minute. But as you can see, there's just not a lot here. It's some piles of, of wood. Uh, we also have the truckload of wood. We have the office and we have the forklift loading some pulp wood logs onto a pulp rack. And that's all it is. So it's a very easy scene to model, and yet it provides a lot of extra interest on your model railroad. It takes up very, very little real estate because this scene is no more than about uh, six to eight inches deep. And really it's only about three or four feet long. So it gives you an industry where you can drop off pulp racks, pick up loaded ones, and therefore you've got an extra industry there on your layout. And you've also got some loads to take somewhere else on your model railroad because these would be serving uh, industries such as paper mills, various other types of plants that use pulp. So there was just a lot of potential industries where you could be delivering these loads of logs. So let's go ahead and take a look at the entire scene. We'll just pan down each way and uh, take a look at it. So if we go to the left, you can see down here, we're getting down to the lower end of the yard where the empty pulp racks are sitting. And then we can come on back up past the loads of logs in the background waiting to be loaded into the cars themselves, past the yard office. And then if we move on up here, that's pretty much it. That's the beginning of the yard itself. So I highly recommend this as an industry that you can add to your model railroad. Doesn't take a lot of time, doesn't take a lot of money, and it doesn't take a lot of effort. And you can add a very interesting industry for your operations on your model railroad and to draw visual interest on the railroad itself and on the layout itself. Well, that's a wrap for today's video. As you can see, it's a pretty easy job to set up a pulp yard and it does add some additional interest and another industry to your model railroad without taking up very much space. So that's it for today. Have a great week, have a great weekend, and I'll see you here next week with another new video from the DCC Guide. Bye now.